Thank you for downloading this episode of A History of Central Florida podcast. This is the podcast where we explore Central Florida's history through the artifacts found in local area museums and historical societies. This series is brought to you by Riches, the regional initiative to collect the history, experiences, and stories of Central Florida, and the Orange County Regional History Center. I am Chip Ford, and I will be your host for today's episode titled Leather Fire Helmet. Leather fire helmets seem like an object of the past, and in some ways they are, but in other ways they are very much an aspect of fire departments today, just as much as they were at the end of the 19th century. Believe it or not, leather fire helmets, like the one that will be examined in this podcast, are still produced today. An object like this fire helmet might appear to be a practical item used for protection and identification. But it is so much more. It is a symbol that connects communities of firefighters from the 19th century to the present in a tradition that persists unlike anything else in your local firehouse. Cairns Fire Helmets, which is the company that made the helmet here, is still in business today and still actively makes and sells leather fire helmets throughout the United States. The leather fire helmet seen here is a typical Cairns production. In the 1920s, around when this fire helmet was made, it was a product of long hours of hard work by a dedicated craftsman. The vine pattern on the brim of the helmet is an identifying factor of Cairns's production, as all of their fire leather helmets had vines wrapping around the brim of the helmet. Although headgear for fighting fires goes back to the 18th century, Henry Gratacap was one of the first men who recognized that fire helmets needed to not only act as identifiers, but also needed to offer the men wearing them protection. Jerry Michaels, a retired firefighter and volunteer at the Denver Firefighters Museum, told us how Gratacap introduced the modern fire helmet as we know it today. The person that designed this was named Henry Gratacap, and he was a luggage maker and a volunteer firefighter in New York City. At the time, uh, the New York City ordered their volunteers to to have a hat of some kind for each company and have it uh, on the front of that cap would be either stitched or painted on there was what company they belonged to so that they could keep order at the fire scene and also that was their form of a badge to allow volunteers to get through the crowds to get in to help fight the fires. Those hats were either were just soft leather, just a, a cap, or made out of felt, and they have no protection whatsoever. Those hats got soggy and every and cold, and so Henry Gratacap invented a hard a leather helmet that was stitched together that had a large brim and around the front and sides, and a, a longer brim in the back, so the water would run off your back and not down the back of your neck. He designed a helmet that he stitched it together just like his luggage. He cut triangular pieces to make the dome of the helmet and stitched them together with heavy welts on the outside, which gave the helmet its strength. Then he was also the inventor of the front piece that you see on fire helmets of this vintage and the one in the museum that identify what company that fire that that person belongs to. And that's called a front piece. He, when he initially designed his, his helmet, it was a lot smaller and the edges were flat. Within a few years, he designed what became the modern version of our fire helmet now, and that was around 1840. Henry Gratacap was not finished with his design. The identifying eagle, which is atop most leather fire helmets made by Cairns today, is also an important aspect of the helmet that remains unchanged over time. Jerry Michaels here tells us when Henry Gratacap might have gotten the idea for this. So he came up with the eagle, and there's uh, several different theories, but nobody knows for sure because I th most people say that he put the eagle on there because it was a patriotic thing, but it worked perfectly for the beak to hold the top of the front piece and was also patriotic and fit the fireman ethic of the time. There's another theory that... in in Trinity Cemetery in downtown New York City, uh, in lower New York, there's a tombstone from a firefighter that died in uh, 1825, and 
it has a sculpture that's on the tombstone as a firefighter coming through the flames holding a baby and a trumpet. And on top of his cap, and they didn't have helmets at the time, was an eagle sitting on top of his cap, kind of a heraldic eagle. And, of course, uh, they said that that could have been the idea if, you know, the if uh, Henry Gretekap had seen that and got his idea from that. Jasper and Henry Cairns perfected the eagle with Gratacap, as Jerry Michaels tells us. His first eagles were made of leather because he was a leather man. They didn't work very well. They were painted leather, but because they stick up in the air running into stuff, they didn't take much of a hit. There were two brothers called the Cairns brothers, the Badge and Insignia Company in, in the neighborhood, and they made brass buttons. They contacted and became partners with Henry Gray to Cap, and they made the first hollow brass eagle, just like the ones that are on this helmet in the museum. That became a big hit because, first of all, they were they were bigger and actually the, looked more like an eagle than the leather eagles did. And that idea really took off for that helmet and also gave it its name. All these helmets were called high eagle helmets from then on. In the 1850s, Gratacap and the Cairns revolutionized fire helmets and created a style that is still known today. Particularly, the sweeping brim of the helmet and the leather filigree around the brim are a standard of a Cairns helmet since that time. Style isn't the only thing that has remained relatively unchanged. First, the brim of the helmet is created by rolling leather through a custom machine to create the proper consistency of the material. Steel wire is later placed in the brim to help it maintain its shape throughout the life of the helmet. The dome of the helmet is made next. The dome is sewn together with heavy-duty cotton thread to create the flaps. The next step is to connect the brim and the dome to each other. First, two seams on the dome are undone and are hammered back. A special tool then hits the dome to square the undone parts so it fits flush against the brim. After it is placed on the brim, it is meticulously measured to make sure the dome is properly centered on the brim. It is then nailed to the brim and then stapled to the brim and prepped for sewing. After being cured for eight weeks, the helmet is adjusted for head size and then covered with a specially formulated compound that makes the entire helmet flame retardant. Much of this process has remained the same for over a century now. Fire Chief Stephen Skip Kerhoff of the Mount Dora Fire Department tells us why the firefighters under his command prefer these leather helmets. They also like a helmet that looks like it's been in a fire. And if you look at that helmet, it looks like it's been curled and bent and gnarled up. Of course, when a fire, when any kind of material like a fire helmet is exposed to a fire or fires and heat on a continuous basis, they actually start to break down. Well, that's about the time that the firefighters like them the most because they, they look like you're, uh, you're an old salt at it. However, some changes to fire helmets have been made, particularly the introduction of alternatives to the leather fire helmet by companies like Cairns. Fire Chief Kerhoff tells us more about these changes. Well, the first thing you see is that there's no eye protection in that helmet, and that's a big one. Uh, so the new helmets, they used to have, when I say new, a few years back, there was a helmet that had what was called Bork shields, and they were actually shields that were hinged uh, under the uh, helmet, and they would flap down and just protect the eyes that way. The newest helmets actually have a huge face shield that flips down and protects the eyes and part of the nose and so forth. Um, but those are the kinds of changes that most firefighters are resistant to. More than anything, leather fire helmets represent a distinctive piece of history in Central Florida. They are not only a part of that history, they also tell a unique story about the traditions that still exist today in firefighting companies. Fire Chief Kerhoff tells us about how the firefighters under his command represent this tradition in choice of fire helmets. Um, our roots go all the way back to Ben Franklin, um, having started one of the very first fire brigades. 
In the fire service, they don't want to get rid of anything that has any traditional value to them. The fire service is 200 years of history unimpeded by progress. Um, anything that, uh, any technologies, they, they have a tendency to fight because we are very traditional orient, oriented. I will supply helmets to these guys. They're great helmets. They've, they've uh, under, uh, undergone um, pretty extensive OSHA testing and standards, and yet they still want the leather helmets. And they will go out and purchase their own at, at sometimes a cost of a $350, $400, whereas the composite helmet that withstands anything that we throw at it would cost less than 200 Although this fire helmet was used and later preserved for exhibition in the Mount Dora History Museum, it represents a link in a long chain of reverence to traditions of the past. Firefighters were not the only people to use leather helmets in the 1920s. College and professional football athletes also wore leather helmets for protection until the 1940s, when the modern plastic helmet was introduced that you see today. Yet, you would be hard-pressed to find your favorite football player choosing a padded leather helmet over the new hard plastic helmets of today. Firefighters across time have constructed a meaning to these helmets that have been handed down from person to person and from place to place over a time that helps to preserve a cherished tradition that a modern plastic fire helmet at the moment cannot replace. We hope you have enjoyed this episode of a History of Central Florida podcast. If you would like to see this and other items that tell the history of Central Florida, you can visit the Mount Dora History Museum at 450 Royal Lou Lane, Mount Dora, Florida, 32757. Make sure to join us for our next episode titled The Art Colony Bell.